Modern America has some huge problems to deal with. The fentanyl epidemic has destroyed entire communities, turning prosperous cities into zombie slums. There's chaos at the border with Mexico as thousands of people easily slip past the failing security net and make their way into the country every single day. With millions pouring in and no one has any idea where they are, America's security is broken down as key infrastructure is slowly replaced with cheaper, unsecure technology. Meanwhile, the quality of life has fallen drastically. Without any other choice, more and more Americans are duped into buying cheap products made with even cheaper labor. The next generation are full of anxiety and doubt, growing up in a world surrounded by hostility and negativity. China has left their mark on all these life-destroying problems. They're making deals with the cartels, infiltrating the information network, and corrupting the entire country. This is the great poisoning of America. In every crisis, China has been pulling the strings from across the sea. Through a systemic campaign, homegrown problems have been made worse, or even entirely newly created, by some random foreign force. And this is all by design. Despite how easily the West has let this happen, it hasn't gone completely unnoticed. Senators and government officials across the developed world have been wringing their hands trying to pin something concrete on China. But just like every other time they try to get to grips with the modern world, they humiliate themselves. This whole pantomime played out once again when the Senate questioned TikTok CEO Xiao Xi Chu on TikTok's links to the CCP. Have you ever applied for Chinese citizenship? Senator, I serve my nation I've in asked, Singapore. I, no, I, I did not. Have you ever been a member of the Chinese Communist Party? Senator, I'm Singaporean. No. It should have cast light on just how integrated TikTok and its parent company ByteDance are with the CCP. They could have asked thousands of awkward questions to put you on the spot, but instead, the American people will remember this moment from the botch questioning, making the senator look like a complete fool, hopelessly clawing at some kind of personal link between China and someone from a completely different country. It isn't surprising that this is by far the most popular clip on TikTok from these interviews, with just under 28 million views, making this whole Chinese conspiracy seem like an absolute joke for right-wing boomers. While it might be convenient that a Chinese app would push this result to the top, that's not the underlying danger here. In the face of the credible threat that China is controlling the West's most influential social media platform, people laughed. It was transformed from a dire warning into yet another opportunity to laugh at America and their inept politicians. Same with Temu, same with Tencent, same with Huawei, same with Fentanyl, same with Chinese spies crossing the border, same with even Fortnite. But China's growing influence on the West is happening right under our noses. It's getting so bad that some tourists think they can enforce their own laws and culture over the laws of the country they're actually in. First, they try to get a man to stop recording his own piano performance. Then they loudly and wrongly accuse him of touching them. Why you're touching her? Stop touching her! Escalating this whole situation and trying to make him seem like a creep, or because they want to enforce China's strict censorship laws in the UK. And as many suggested, these people may possibly have been Chinese spies, as MI6 is currently investigating this. I mean, when you analyze the things they do and their reactions in this situation, it becomes clear they're following the classic scene CCP playbook. They begin by assuming their laws apply in other countries, and try to push their own values onto another culture. They clearly feel entitled to Western freedoms while still applying Chinese laws and waving Chinese flags. When they get pushed back, they respond with escalation and they derail the situation. Why are you discriminating a different country? Why are you dis discriminating a different country? That's why immediately they start shouting, don't touch her, when they see they aren't winning the current arguments. It's all about not even acknowledging the other point of view, whilst derailing the conversation to distract from China's many flaws and abuses. Their aggressively amateur attempts at these tactics mirror what you constantly see online if you know what to look for. The so-called 50 cent party is what people online call China's army of trolls. They post incessantly, either reinforcing CCP ideology or directing people away from the embarrassing truth. It's pretty hard for the average person to figure out when they're reading one of these posts. Think of how how many different people's opinions you read online in just 10 minutes of scrolling, then there are the real people getting duped and spreading propaganda without even realizing it. It all blends into itself, making it very hard to track. There hasn't been nearly enough research on this, but one study estimates that the CCP's army of propagandists make nearly 450 million posts a year. In a campaign of whitewashing, they flood the internet with distractions and other discussion whenever they need to cover something up and reduce its impact. You're not just imagining it, and the fact that barely anyone has even heard of this is proof that it's working. And so as we go on, you'll see all the different ways that the CCP has been poisoning the culture of the West. One example of the CCP's infiltration practices is their presence in Western universities. In the UK and across the West, the CCP has set up the Confucius Institute, a kind of state-sponsored organization which they say is designed to promote Chinese values and support Chinese citizens working in education abroad. What it really is though is a means of controlling their own citizens when they go to foreign countries. Tons of Chinese students go to the West for an education. The fees their parents pay are what keep a large proportion of Western universities afloat. And for Chinese students, they come to get an education outside of the hands of the CCP. 
GDP. For this influx of people and cash, the universities have given the Confucius Institutes free reign over managing the staff, and with this power as revealed by the report conducted in the UK, they control who teaches these Chinese students. Any Chinese teachers applying to these universities are subject to intense background checks and controls. If they don't seem patriotic enough to China, or don't fit in with the CCP's values, then they don't get hired even in America. It means that in their few years away from the CCP, China can keep their wealthy and highly educated young people indoctrinated and compliant. A sickening detail is that the UK government was funding these institutes on top of the 10 billion that China spends until very recently. That means Western citizens were having their own tax money used to fund the CCP's thought control machine in universities. And this is just one example of how far the CCP has gone to control discourse and extend that reach into the West, and how stupid the West has been to allow all of this to happen and inadvertently promote it. But if China has the power to indoctrinate people in an entirely different country with the help of Western governments, how deep does their influence really go? Well, as we'll explore today, Xi Jinping's China has spent the last decade strengthening their grip on the West and slowly poisoning us as they turn in the direction of conquering more of the world and becoming the major superpower in the long run. This is the story of how China has been actively poisoning America and the West for the last 10 years, and how they've gotten away with it. And finally, where the future is headed. China's People Liberation Army will intensify its troops training and enhance its combat readiness as they are determined to fight against any movement of Taiwan's independence. Taiwan says 28 Chinese warplanes, including fighter jets and nuclear-capable bombers, crossed into its airspace. As the tension between Taiwan and China is growing, top military analysts warn that an invasion could cost many American lives. All around the world, we're seeing global conflicts hike up prices and make the economy more and more unstable. And you can take a wild guess as to who will be most affected. By this summer, JP Morgan strategists expect 99% of Americans to be worse off financially than they were pre-pandemic. But fortunately for you, the lucky 1%'s best kept investing secret is out. It's about diversifying your investments with alternative assets like fine art. These are extremely valuable assets, and unlike a publicly traded company, that value is less likely to be affected by current events. Which is why it is isn't just billionaires collecting it. The world's biggest banks have done it for centuries. Years ago, it would take millions of dollars in art market connections to invest in art, but thousands of savvy investors have been growing their savings thanks to our sponsors and Masterworks. Masterworks is an award-winning company that allows you to invest in art from the comfort of your own home. And these aren't some amateurs. They've got some of the biggest names in the business. Picasso Banksy, Coors Basquiat. Offerings this popular have sold out within the hour, but you can skip the line and start investing today. Just use the special link in the description below. During a recent interview with Tucker Carlson, Russia's President Vladimir Putin made a chilling statement. The West he warned is in decline. Now, it's not really a surprise to most of us at this point, but at the same time, he noted the obvious. China is rising in the background, with Putin even referring to China's leader Xi Jinping as his friend. We, together with my colleague and friend President Xi Jinping, set the goal to reach $200 billion in mutual trade with China this year. We have exceeded this level, he said. As China's General Administration of Customs recently noted, bilateral trade with Russia has risen 26.3% in 2020. 2023, hitting a record high of $240 billion, even during the war. Moreover, China's exports also grew by 46.9%, reaching $110 billion, with imports also increasing by 12.7%, which equates to about $130 billion. Think about this for a second. Virtually all powerful Western countries, NATO, the majority of the world has completely shunned Russia, and yet Russia is arguably thriving right now. It became clear with Tucker Carlson showing that going to Moscow is like taking a red pill from an American perspective. So we're going to try and buy what a family of four would buy every week, and we're going to see what the selection is, and we're going to see what it costs. I went from amused to legitimately angry. So we were guessing what this would cost. Everybody here is from the United States buys groceries, and we didn't pay any attention to costs as we were just putting in the cart what we would actually eat over a week. And we all came in around 400 bucks, about 400 bucks. Um, it was $104 US here. And that's when you start to realize that ideology maybe doesn't matter as much as you thought, corruption. If you take people's standard of living and you tank it through filth and crime and inflation, and they literally can't buy the groceries they want, at that point, maybe it matters less what you say or whether you're a good person or a bad person. You're wrecking people's lives in their country, and that's what our leaders have done to us. Everything seems perfect. Its infrastructure smooth, its streets absolutely spotless, and its economy seemingly thriving. 
And this is really only possible because of China. With all of this secretly highlighting that if Russia is thriving, then how powerful is China becoming if it's the one mostly funding this? And it's also why most countries in the West should be concerned about China taking over the US as the world's superpower, as China doesn't play by the West rules. In truth, it doesn't play by anyone's rules but its own, more specifically Xi Jinping's rules. And to understand modern China and why it's such a threat to the Western ideals of liberty, freedom, and the pursuit of happiness, we need to understand who Xi Jinping really is and his master plan to take down America. You see, Xi is the son of a revolutionary veteran who played a significant role in the establishment of the Communist Party. Due to his prestigious lineage, Xi is categorized as a princeling, defined as a child of esteemed high-ranking officials who have ascended through the ranks, with his father actually being very close with Mao Zedong, the guy who killed the most people in the 20th century and yet somehow praised on t-shirts, and this had a huge impact on Xi. But his path to glory wouldn't be a straightforward one, as his family fortune soon took a drastic turn during the Cultural Revolution, when his father would be in prison in 1962 by Mao Zedong, his once associate. This was due to Mao Zedong's increasing paranoia of any potential rebellions within the Communist Party, and so he initiated the purge of potential adversaries, leading to the infamous Cultural Revolution in 1966. This period witnessed widespread labeling of millions as enemies of Chinese culture, resulting in violent attacks throughout the nation, the destruction of China's historical relics, the destruction of religion, the destruction of creativity, the destruction of anything about China that wasn't communist, the Buddhist temples burned to the ground, the rich culture of China scrubbed from existence, and Xi's family bared the brunt of this. With Xi Jinping's half-sister, the first daughter of his father, was actually persecuted to death as per official accounts, and Xi was abruptly withdrawn from a school attended by children of political elites. But eventually at the age of 15, he departed Beijing and was sent to the countryside for a period of quote, re-education and arduous labor in the remote and impoverished village of Lianghai in the northeastern region of China, where he would have remained for seven years, completely stripped of everything he knew from Beijing and his entire family. But Xi Jinping had been trained from birth that one day he would be the one to take down the US, to take down the Western imperialists, the capitalist machine. He would rise above his father and be the new version of Mao. He was dreaming of this his entire life, and he was close to it, right inside the political elite of China. He knew that of all the people within this elite circle, he had the most drive and ambition to take over the country, and afterwards the entire world. And that's why, contrary to turning against the Communist Party during this re-education period, Xi Jinping actually embraced communism instead. Despite his dad being imprisoned and his half-sister being murdered, with constant rejections because of his father's reputation, Xi Jinping continued. He was driven, intelligent, and articulate, and he would do everything he needed to take control of China once and for all. This was his destiny. And that's why eventually, even after multiple rejections, he was finally accepted in 1974 back into the Communist Party. From there, he gradually climbed the ranks, assuming more senior positions along the way. But by 1989, the Communist Party control of China was starting to wear. There was no strong authoritarian leader like Mao Zedong anymore. It was a bunch of nameless liberalist faces, wearing suits, running the Communist Party, opening up to the US. The United States of America and the People's Republic of China have agreed to recognize each other and to establish diplomatic relations as of January the 1st, 1979. Welcoming in US presidents, becoming the world's sweatshop. And because of this, China as a whole became more liberal. It started opening up, and people across China were now demanding more political freedom, just like the rest of the world was now seeing, ultimately erupting in Beijing's Tiananmen Square. And by this point, Xi Jinping was already solidified in the Communist Party. He was horrified by these people protesting for their own individualist rights. He wanted a collectivist whole, an entire nation controlled by one single entity, all working to communist ideals, just like Mao Zedong had envisioned. But this this was a time of people rejecting Mao Zedong. People hated the Cultural Revolution and the fact that they were so restricted in their country. Xi Jinping was horrified by this. They were traitors to the country and the communist utopia China was working towards. And so he took immediate action along with other party officials to contain the dramatic demonstrations. The protests which reflected the division within the Communist Party and the subsequent violent crackdown have been effectively erased from China's official records and history books. They do everything to scrub this event. The country even lost the opportunity to host the 2000 Olympics due to the human rights abuses that occurred during Tiananmen Square, because the number of casualties during the crackdown is estimated to be up to thousands of people, thousands of lives trampled on. It was noontime today in the center of Beijing when a man walked to the middle of the avenue of eternal peace, which as it happened was already occupied. He walked to the middle and stood there. The man was alone, the tank was not. It wasn't just a single tank he stopped, there were 18 tanks and armored carriers in this convoy, and while he talked to the crew and ignored the gunfire, he stopped all of them. The famous Tiananmen Square Man 
was mowed down, completely crushed by a tank with no remorse. All protesters had their bones squashed into the ground. It was barbaric. All protesters were shot down. No remorse. Everyone who dared talk back to the Communist Party would find themselves in an early grave. But because of Xi Jinping's willingness to crack down on these protesters, these people wanting their own personal freedom, Xi Jinping continued to rise amongst the ranks. He was beginning to be one of the favoured people amongst China's elites. So much so that he was entrusted with overseeing the 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing, a huge event, one that would mark China's presence across the world as no longer a third world nation, but a vastly developed superpower. Before the Summer Olympics, people didn't really have any idea of how fast China had developed in such a short time. During the 1980s, China was still engulfed in poverty, but by 2008, China had the fastest Wi-Fi, the best infrastructure, huge sky rises, some of the most developed architecture in the world, incredible transport systems, and the world's biggest middle class population. Huge moves were being made in China, and the Communist Party was becoming ever more powerful. Xi Jinping was given the role of marketing China as the new world power to take down America, and it was a success. The 2008 Summer Olympics in Beijing was an absolute phenomenon. I think the top line quite simply is that the Beijing Games look set to be the biggest broadcast event in Olympic history. It's one of the most memorable Olympics in world history. It was completely spectacular, everything went to plan. It was where people like Usain Bolt would make their own name. And soon after, foreign direct investment flooded China. Everybody wanted to invest in this rising country. Opportunity was everywhere. And China's GDP growth was the fastest the 21st century has ever seen. And one man stood amongst them all within China, Xi Jinping, the man who orchestrated this Olympic. Because of this huge success, Xi was eventually accepted into the Politburo Standing Committee, the highest decision-making body, the people running China, the ones controlling the Communist Party, and all the power that came with it. And by 2012, he was eventually chosen as China's president. What we saw is basically the delegates of um, the National People's Congress voted first to confirm uh, Xi Jinping as uh, China's head of state, uh, as its president, and then to elect him to be the head of the military. Now, how does any of this relate to the West today? How does it relate to the border crisis, the fentanyl crisis, Temu, TikTok, Clash of Clans, or any of this stuff? And why does it even matter at all? Who cares about Gen Z TikTok is vaping? Well, this might all sound like the same story as you'd hear with any politician around the world. A guy coming from the elite rising up to take power over country. But the story of Xi matters a lot, as it explains why the world is becoming more depressed, drug addicted, and exposed like never before. And ultimately explains why we're finding ourselves on the precipice of a third world war. The United States is worried about conflict with Russia, China, Iran. Uh, these multipolar worlds tend to be unstable, like during World War I. Um, nuclear weapons may no longer be the dominant military technology with artificial intelligence, quantum computing, and others maybe uh, putting us on the uh, eve of a new revolution in military affairs. With countries like the UK now telling their populations to become ready for war, for European men to be ready for forced military conscriptions, and for the entire West to mentally prepare in the event of a full-blown World War III. This is really happening, especially in Europe. And whilst this might sound all dramatic, I promise you it's anything but. And to understand why, we need to understand exactly what happened in China after Xi became president, and where the future of the world is headed. You see, upon becoming president in March 2013, Xi Jinping quickly moved to consolidate his power within the Communist Party. Soon after becoming president, he was then named chairman of the newly formed National Security Commission in 2013, giving him control over China's security apparatus. And with this control, he started doing what all other great dictators do best, purging all political opponents, or as the CCP describes, carrying out an anti-corruption campaign. A top Chinese official has been charged with accepting bribes, stealing state secrets, and abusing his power. Ling Jihua was one of the most trusted advisors to former President Liu Jintao. He served in a role similar to that of chief of staff. His indictment part of an enormous corruption crackdown by President Xi Jinping, targeting thousands of government officials for accepting or offering bribes. That targeted high-ranking officials in the party, military, and state-owned enterprises. This was the time when Chinese billionaires started disappearing all over the place, being kidnapped by the CCP, never to be found again. However, the campaign not only helped to improve the CCP's image tarnished by corruption over the last few years, but also removed all rivals that could threaten Xi Jinping's position at the top. He had achieved his entire vision, his dream and destiny. 
he finally had ultimate control over China and by extension became one of the most powerful men in the entire world. But he still wasn't the most powerful man. And so he can just put his feet up like that. Because controlling China was one thing, but controlling the entire world was a completely different ballgame. At the time, the US still completely controlled the world. And no matter what anyone said, Xi knew he would have to do everything within his power to slowly weaken the US to ensure China's place at the top of the world. You see, for his entire life, he had despised the Western way of doing things. His dad was a colleague of Mao Zedong. He'd been brought up within the elites of the Communist Party, and he was a fervent believer in communism. He despised the Chinese leaders who opened up China's doors to liberal ideas and economic freedom. He saw these people as being traitors, as giving up China's power, as he saw this as the West way of infiltrating and poisoning the Chinese spirit. But no more. It was time for vengeance, to take down the US empire once and for all. But if he was going to do this, he would need more power, more connections, and more money. So Xi Jinping would get started by introducing a series of economic reforms. The aim was to transition China from instead being this high-speed GDP model of growth, where the entire economy was based on the fact that China was just a giant sweatshop, to being a more sustainable, high-quality growth path that was less dramatic, but far more stable. This was needed, as by 2013, it was becoming clear that there were growing issues within China, as its entire success economically came from its slave-like labor of hordes of people stuffed into these sweatshop factories under these horrible conditions where people were taking their lives so much that they had to put nets around these factories, or to make the world's goods for incredibly cheap prices, at the sacrifice of the Chinese spirit. But now that the country was becoming evidently richer and richer, it would be incredibly hard to maintain the standard of living. The people demanded higher pay and better conditions, as China's infrastructure and cities developed to rival those of the US, with the biggest middle class population in the world, how could they continue to be a country that relied entirely of an economy of cheap Chinese labor? People wanted higher minimum wages and some labor rights, but this was difficult, as it was the main thing driving China's growth, and to sacrifice this could be detrimental to the entire country and its plans for world domination. It wasn't just companies like Apple and Nike using these sweatshops. The entire world's economy was propped up by these Chinese sites like Xi'an. You see, long before Tammy started making headlines recently, Xi'an was making the news, and quite often for all the wrong reasons. Xi'an halls are typically young women showing off hundreds of dollars in merchandise. They've been going viral on social media since 2020. We have a massive back to school Xi'an hall. This order was $200. This massive churn through products may not cost consumers a lot of money, but it does have a price. Some consumers have started pushing back on the company. Even the Judice family faced criticism for their partnership. It was a fast fashion retailer that was established in 2008, and the company experienced remarkable growth and was seen as the world's largest fashion retailer. Like Temu, it gained popularity for offering incredibly cheap products, too cheap to even make any sense. And then there were other Chinese companies like Huawei, which did the exact same thing but in technology, with companies like Hawaii being subsidized so much that they were losing billions of money. It was quite literally impossible for anyone in the world to make cheaper technology products because everyone else in the world needs to eventually make a profit. But this wasn't the case in China. They just wanted to make sure that these products were so cheap and so accessible that everyone depended on China, as it was these cheap products that made China deepen its influence across the world. With all of these kinds of companies following the same general protocol, a company board controlled by the government stealing Western IPs and using their giant influence for developing economic control and technological surveillance to control foreign citizens and businesses. But these giant Chinese companies were always unable to become real normal businesses because as Reuters has shown, if a Chinese company wants US stock listings, then it must hand over all of its data to Beijing, something that's never going to be accepted in somewhere like the US. It was clear that China had to modernize to become more trustworthy. Xi'an and Huawei had been sued into the ground already. Nobody trusted these cheap Chinese products. And China's reputation for stealing products from the West and then just remaking them but in a worse way was destroying its reputation as being a modern developer country. If China were to be taken seriously on the global stage, they had to become more professional. So Xi's first steps towards this began with reducing the country's reliance on exports and investment in favor of increased consumption. Xi's administration also pushed for the Made in China 2025 initiative, aiming to upgrade the Chinese economy into a global leader in high-tech industries. And within the first year of Xi's presidency, he had already announced the Belt and Road Initiative, a global development strategy that was originally designed by Mao Zedong himself that involved infrastructure development and investments in countries across Asia, Europe, Africa, and beyond. The Belt Road Initiative represented China's ambition to take a more central role in global affairs and reshape the international order to better align with its interests. The plan was to make it easier for anyone in the world to trade with China, through railways, highways, seaports, and routes across the Arctic to reach Europe in less than an hour. 
It's been 10 years since China rolled out an ambitious infrastructure and investment project stretching across the globe. The Belt and Road Initiative helped pave the way for the expansion of China's worldwide reach, while also offering a golden opportunity for lower-income countries. And best of all, if China was able to pull this off, it'd mean a bunch of anti-US allies would join together with China, all connected by these high-speed railways and amazing transport links, to completely weaken the West's economic influence. However, there was an issue here. The project would cost hundreds of billions if not trillions to perform. And at the same time, they didn't want to rely on these Western capitals over the Pacific. They needed to find allies for the Chinese cause to achieve this communist utopia and assert Xi Jinping's position as the most powerful man in the world. And so they would launch the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank in 2015, seen as a counterbalance to the Western dominated financial system in a tour to extend China's influence globally. Because China realized they couldn't just rely on other countries' businesses to prop up their own economy, and they couldn't just steal stuff from other countries anymore, as it just made their reputation seem so untrustworthy to do business with. As an example, of the internal innovation they used, the example of the 4,000 miles of high-speed rail in China. A week later, I found out that Kawasaki Heavy Industries is suing China for theft of IP because it was their IP. <laughs> well, a lot so this of wasn't local innovation in China, this was stealing from the Japanese. They needed to be taken seriously and expand their influence in the world. After all, Xi Jinping understood the power Silicon Valley and Western media has in controlling the global narrative. He saw that with Facebook and Google, that whoever controls the algorithms controls the culture. But China had no cultural influence. This was the US's most powerful weapon, and it had been since Hollywood. This was a huge problem. No one consumes Chinese media anywhere, apart from in China. And this became obvious during the Chinese takeover of Hong Kong, when Chinese leaders realized they had zero control outside of China on what people thought about the CCP. Once they did create laws, making it illegal to criticize the CCP even if you're abroad, this obviously wouldn't do anything. As soon as the CCP invaded Hong Kong, protests sparked all over the world in support of Hong Kong's fight against the CCP's oppression, making this once democratic nation a communist dystopian nation. All over Reddit, Facebook and Twitter were millions of posts calling out the darkness that was sweeping over Hong Kong. The protesters being killed, the leaders of freedom being kidnapped, and the destruction of freedom within the country. Everyone saw China for what it was. And this was a terrible look for China. Almost no one in the world supported them. And it became clear to Xi that if China were to take over the US, and for Xi to become the most powerful man in the world, China would need to make their own algorithms, to control the global media, to control what people saw on their devices. And this would mark the beginning of the poisoning of America. Now I've already mentioned the economic plans to modernize and become trustworthy, but if you're aiming for global dominance, you can't just simply make more money and work within the global economy and somehow rise above the US, this is impossible. The economic world order is structured by the US, and so the only way to rise above it is to destroy the one making the rules in the first place. But how? How could China poison the US without making it obvious and having any retaliation? What would be the best strategy for doing this subtly? Well, once you understand the book, The Art of War, China's strategy starts to make a lot of sense. You see, The Art of War has been one of the most popular books throughout Chinese history for millennia, and is the core philosophy within the Chinese spirit. And so it should be no surprise that Xi Jinping has lived his entire life with this book in his mind. He was raised with it. It came down from Mao Zedong, through to his dad, throughout all of the Communist Party, and he used it to also get to the top of the Chinese political system. And by 2013, now firmly in power, he was done to use this against the world. The concept of weakening the enemy without engaging in direct combat is a hallmark of Sun Tzu's The Art of War. It's an ancient Chinese book that hugely influenced both Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping. And one of Xi Jinping's favorite lines in The Art of War was, quote, the supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without fighting, which completely encapsulates China's current ambition to destroy the US, undermining the enemy's ability to wage war, thus avoiding the cost and destruction inherent in battle, or in other words, poisoning the enemy so much over time that they can't even put up a strong fight against you, allowing you to take over without any bloodshed. The other key components of the art of war are so eerily parallel to what Xi Jinping is doing right now, that it's almost impossible to ignore this current strategy being used against America. Which is why throughout this video, you'll notice these key points in the art of war keep coming up again and again.
because this is the framework for China to poison America. So here are the key points to remember. One, deception is critical to the art of war according to Sun Tzu. Misleading the enemy about one's intentions, capabilities, and movements can sow confusion, disarray, and lead to poor decision making and expose vulnerabilities without the need for physical confrontation. Two, psychological warfare. Targeting the enemy's morale and psychological state is a hugely effective strategy through misinformation, propaganda, perhaps drugs, and other psychological tactics, which makes it very possible to weaken the enemy's resolve, induce fear, and create internal conflict. Three, strategic flexibility, being unpredictable and adaptive allows for the exploitation of the enemy's weaknesses. Four, espionage and intelligence. Knowledge is power, and understanding the enemy's plans, strengths, and weaknesses is crucial. Effective intelligence gathering enables informed strategic decisions, allowing for attacks on the enemy's weak points and avoidance of their strengths. 5. Economic warfare. Attacking the enemy's economic base and cutting off their resources can severely limit their ability to sustain military efforts. And the final one, indirect approaches. Instead of a head-on confrontation, attacking the enemy's alliances, supply lines, or morale targets their ability to fight effectively, weakening all of the enemy's support structures and logistical capabilities, making their position untenable. And as you can see so far in Xi Jinping's journey, this stuff's already been used in full force. And as you can imagine, later in this video, it will become very clear how all six points are destroying the entire West's survival, but we'll get onto that soon. However, with this understanding, it then starts to make sense how China has been poisoning America since Xi Jinping took office in 2012, just one year into Xi Jinping's presidency. And suddenly out of nowhere, fentanyl started pouring out of China and flowing into the United States. Now, despite the fact that China has some of the strictest drug laws in the world, with people getting the death penalty just for smoking a joint, it's somewhat surprising then that China is the manufacturing hub of fentanyl. According to the US-China Economic and Security Review Commission, China is considered the main source of illicit fentanyl and fentanyl-related substances trafficked into the United States, and it all happened just as Xi Jinping came into power. China has various means to crack down on illegal drug production and exports, but why would they? This fits in with the art of war, to subdue the enemy, to find their weaknesses, to addict them, to make them weak, and destroy their population and communities. I mean, it's not a coincidence that as soon as fentanyl started reaching the US, this was exactly the same time that Xi Jinping started his wider 2045 ambition to take over the world. Listen to what he was talking about, the way he was explaining how they, you know, they have this plan, I think he said 2049, to be the, the global superpower of the world and mm -hmm. essentially be take the place of what America used to be. Yeah, they, do it their way. And they do it their way, which means we're going to bypass all the costs and the heavy lift of research and development over the years, and we're just going to steal everything. Yeah. And they've been doing it for decades. Rather than directly shipping drugs from China to the US, Chinese drug traffickers have established strong alliances with Mexican drug cartels and set up their own laboratories to make fentanyl within Mexico and ship it directly over the border. Reports by the US government reveals that Chinese traffickers have shifted their focus from manufacturing finished fentanyl to exporting necessary ingredients to Mexican cartels, who then produce illicit fentanyl and distribute the final product. This entire fentanyl crisis has been manufactured by China, which is why the CCP refuses to cooperate with the US when it comes to this stuff. And you see most of this fentanyl coming into the US is going through shipping ports. And interestingly enough, Chinese companies, which are partly run by the CCP and have very strong connections to Beijing, have made significant investments in various Mexican ports. What a random thing to invest in. In fact, in 2015, Chinese investors entered into an agreement to construct a new port in Nayarit, a state south of Sinaloa, the hub of cartels in Mexico. And it turned out when the US imposed sanctions on four of the key guys importing fentanyl into the US, the main way they were smuggling in fentanyl was through a Chinese harbor, a subsidiary of the state-owned China Communications Construction Company, with all these Chinese-run ports playing a huge role in facilitating the fentanyl epidemic throughout America. I mean, ask yourself this, why did this fentanyl epidemic only happen during this period of Chinese global ambition under Xi? Why is there no other major country going through a fentanyl crisis? Why is America seeing a zombie-like apocalypse on its streets in Kensington, Philadelphia, or in the Tenderloin area of San Francisco? And why doesn't this happen in China. And of course, it isn't just fentanyl here. In fact, there's a whole array of substances slowly poisoning America without us even noticing where it came from. 
I mean vaping. This has just taken over the US recently. It's part of the high school experience now. And where do 90% of the world's vaping devices come from? China. And it just so happens this coincides with Xi's rise to power. It's getting so bad in the US that almost everywhere you go, you now see people vaping. Many of these people are young kids. Representative Dan Newhouse raised concerns about the widespread availability of illegal Chinese manufactured flavored disposable vaping products, where he highlighted the fact that many of these products are produced in unregulated facilities and may contain the aforementioned fentanyl, posing a significant threat to the health and well-being of American children. In fact, half of American kids who try vaping become addicted to it, and more than 2 million kids in middle school and high school are regular vapors. Another way the CCP has achieved this is through the manufacture of counterfeit THC vape pens. As America started legalizing all throughout the 2010s, China wanted to tap into this market. And of course, they weren't making this for the Chinese market. Over the mid to late 2010s, the THC vapes that came out of nowhere immediately dominated the market, taking the US by storm. Sales skyrocketed across the US as cannabis legalization took hold of America, with a study showing that by 2018, around 35% of young cannabis users were vaping it. It was easy for China's black market to adapt to the growing demand. Using the same routes they had created for fentanyl precursors and other illicit goods, they could ship tons and tons of illicit THC vapes to the US and beyond. Despite the wave of legislation, it was a tempting offer for the US customers. You could get THC vapes that look the same, work the same, and got you just as high, all for a much lower price. Little did people know, they weren't going to be paying with their wallets. With no outside regulation or interference from the Chinese authorities, illicit vape manufacturers were free to cut corners whilst making THC vapes, regardless of how dangerous it truly was. One was by using cheaper toxic chemicals in the manufacturing process, chemicals like vitamin E, acetate, now known to cause cancers and extreme lung damage, popcorn lungs, and a whole host of other issues. And this chemical was then stuffed into these illicit vapes. And that's why a few years later in 2019, and studies came out showing that 50% of THC vapes contain the hazardous substance, with later studies also confirming there was behind a string of deaths linked to these THC vapes. Many users saw weed as a healthy alternative to alcohol. Little did they realize, they were inhaling some of the most carcinogenic substances out there. One 15-year-old caught up in the epidemic had lungs like those of a 70-year-old. The media picked up the story in a big wave, and people got a lot more wary of cheap Chinese vapes. But this young man's lung damage was likely caused by vaping flavored THC-containing products. Meanwhile, vaping-related injuries in the US number more than 2,200 with 47 deaths. THC vapes fell by 15% in just the first week after the scandal, but the Chinese manufacturers didn't need to be worried for long. As THC vapes lost their profitability, they realized they could easily make these fake nicotine vapes instead. The switchover nearly coincided with a massive rise in the use of disposable vapes across the West. The US ban on flavored jewel pods left disposable vapes untouched, when combined with their convenience and accessibility for young children, and you can see why they took off. In the US, disposable vape sales rose from under a quarter of the market in 2020 to over half of it by 2022. Western brands like Elf Bar and Lost Mary laid the groundwork of recognizable products with bright packaging and kid-friendly flavors. All the Chinese manufacturers had to do was copy the blueprints, switch out the parts with much cheaper versions, and watch the money roll in. It helped that most of the Western companies were doing their manufacturing in China anyway. While their legitimate factories might follow proper safety protocols, it didn't stop them from sending the blueprints and designs over to other, less reputable factories. The kinds of factories where footage like this was recorded. What better way is there to test that your products are working before sending them abroad? And just like with the THC vapes, there are problems with these counterfeit Chinese nicotine vapes as well. They don't have controls for what people are actually ingesting, and the cheap batteries they use either prematurely stop working or explode in people's pockets as they suck on their little battery vape. A particular problem has been in airports or airplanes, where cheap e-cig batteries have caused over 30 explosive incidences. Western brands have tried to crack down on the fakes, adding QR codes or special seals of authenticity, but the kids buying these at corner stores or gas stations aren't going to be checking QR codes before they start puffing on these disposable batteries, and the CCP surely doesn't care about this either. They want this. Now, they've banned flavored vapes outright, and they actually enforce these laws domestically very strictly. Making them for export, though, is a whole other story. Xi Jinping's unofficial line is that you can get as many Western kids addicted as you want. Chinese manufacturers can use whatever unsanitary, dangerous methods they please, as long as the product leaves China before getting it to the consumer. 
Of course, China is aware of the dangers and potential fatality associated with flavored disposable vape pads. And so in response, China seemed to work with the US and actually imposed strict regulations on the production and sale of these products within its borders. However, these regulations don't extend to the products manufactured and sold by China in the US and other countries. As a result, almost no one really knows the chemicals, toxins, and nicotine levels present in these products that are poisoning American children, leaving most people completely uninformed about what their kids are actually inhaling. As Marco Rubio recently pointed out, when it comes to addressing the Chinese elephant in the room, the US continues to fail in a dramatic manner. In a letter to the FDA, he wrote, quote, law-abiding American companies wait years, spend millions of dollars, and comply with strict restrictions on flavors and marketing in order to gain FDA approval for their products. Meanwhile, Chinese government-run companies are sending shipping containers full of illegal e-cigarettes into our country every day, right under the nose of the FDA and US Customs and Border Protection. The FDA's attempts at enforcement have proven totally inadequate. And he's right, and there's a reason for this happening. And no one seems to see the 4D chess game that China is playing with the West, as it's all part of Xi Jinping's slow plan to poison America. But when Xi Jinping is seen having pints of beer with world leaders, it seems like this would just be an accident, just a result of China being the world's manufacturer. Surely if you're a huge country like China, you just ship anything that people want. Well, if only that were true, because it doesn't stop there. This is just the tip of the iceberg, as in the following years, the consequences of this would become far more dramatic. This is just the first layer of the poisoning of America. Now that we can see the dramatic changes that happened in the following three years of she becoming president, we can then understand how the CCP was able to hijack social media algorithms to their favor. This will be one of the most important things I've ever spoken about on the channel, so pay very close attention. In 2010, the internet was changing, and China's growing middle class saw a huge rise in people using mobile phones and the internet, marking a huge change in how Chinese consumers access online services. This is when a huge amount of Chinese people started adopting phones, with many Chinese users opting for smartphones as their primary internet device over traditional computers. Increasingly, Xi Jinping saw that China could never let foreign Silicon Valley companies dominate the tech industry. He thought that China was already way too open to the West, and if Silicon Valley put its tentacles into China, it could take down the entire CCP ideology and spark revolution across the country. The CCP was already aware of the power of Hollywood in manipulating the Chinese public into adopting Western ideals, which is why the CCP enforced a law in which Chinese censors would hand select a limited number of foreign movies to be watched every year, forcing big Hollywood companies like Disney to pander to Chinese audiences and appease the Chinese censors to get into the Chinese market. And this had been working great so far. For the most part, the CCP had no real backlash since Tiananmen Square where nobody consumed anything that the government didn't allow. Brad Pitt starring in the 1997 film Seven Years in Tibet, another country that China has conquered. And being in that film landed Brad Pitt in very hot water with Chinese authorities. They essentially banned Brad Pitt and his film from China for years and years. However, if the West was able to freely influence the Chinese population with their culture, especially through things like Facebook and YouTube, it could then destroy the CCP's control in a matter of years, foiling Xi Jinping's plans for world domination. Because as I mentioned earlier, whoever controls the algorithms picks the president, and social media is an existential threat to the entire existence of the Chinese government if it isn't controlled by the CCP. So at first, Xi Jinping knew that before trying to control the algorithms of the West and manipulate the US population, they had to perfect social media control on their own population to begin with. And what better tool to do this with than the Chinese mega corporation Tencent? Now, most people have never heard the name Tencent before, and yet it's one of the most powerful companies in the world right now, and one of the CCP's greatest weapons. They own everything. All the games you see, like Clash of Clans, Able Pool, games like Fortnite, and social media sites like Discord and Reddit, and so much more. Funding NBA games, and everything you can imagine. But before we get into what they control in the West today, we need to understand how they became so big in the first place. You see, Tencent got so big because it capitalized on China's regulatory environment to outmaneuver international competitors and cultivate a lucrative business model based on working hand in hand with the CCP to build up China's very own Silicon Valley. With huge subsidies, CCP members joining the Tencent board, and the Chinese company and the government becoming inseparable, it meant that China would always favor Tencent over any other company outside of China, making Tencent basically just an arm of the CCP. But with this, Tencent 
Tencent was able to aggressively scale up in just a matter of years, becoming a huge part of the daily lives of Chinese citizens. And one of the key ways they did this, not only through CCP subsidies and beneficial Chinese laws, but Tencent CEO Pony Ma had a very unconventional strategy. Instead of relying solely on Tencent's existing resources and capabilities as a CCP-run mega company, he decided that Tencent should essentially disrupt itself from within. To achieve this, he initiated the creation of not one, but three separate teams within the company, each tasked with developing a new mobile messaging application. This approach was designed to foster a sense of internal competition within the company, where Tencent's teams were set up to compete against each other, driving innovation and urgency between the company, whilst also collectively aiming to outpace any external foreign competition. Meaning that no Silicon Valley competition could ever beat Tencent, it was quite literally impossible because Tencent was constantly putting all of its resources and the CCPs into making new products and constantly innovating, always outdoing their current products with new separate businesses. Pony Ma thought it was better for Tencent to disrupt its own operations and potentially cannibalize its existing products than be caught off guard by external Western competition that could threaten the entire Chinese state's survival. And as it grew and grew, with more and more state funding, Tencent tried to copy existing apps like WhatsApp as the CCP and Tencent saw that these free chat services were almost a vital daily part of everyone's lives. But these companies were free private companies, and with American laws, technically these companies couldn't read your messages, especially with WhatsApp being encrypted. But what if the CCP could create its own WhatsApp, but where they would read every single message sent through it, controlling the flow of all conversations taking place within China? So at first, Tencent actually tried to acquire WhatsApp for $10 billion. However, due to Pony Ma's back surgery that delayed negotiations, the acquisition never went through. And whilst this happened, Mark Zuckerberg swooped in and acquired WhatsApp for almost double the price. So Tencent would decide they would create their own version of WhatsApp, but for China. And this would lead to a key tool of the CCP, an app known as WeChat. As soon as WeChat was created, it would rapidly evolve, as it began to incorporate everything into the app. This wasn't just a knockoff version of WhatsApp. Tencent and the CCP's ambition for WeChat was to create an all-encompassing ecosystem that would not only allow people to message each other instantly, but also to have every single important app, things like Uber, social media, payments, banking, anything you can think of all within one app. Most of these features were actually just copied from other people, but it was all lumped into one single app. And by 2012, WeChat's user base had already grown to 100 million users. It only took over a year for this to happen, and it highlighted Tencent's broader strategy of creating these central hubs that would control everything in a person's life. Which is why WeChat became dubbed the Everything app, as within just a few years, its user base would then reach 1.4 billion users, who dedicated an average of four hours daily to the app. No other app in history has done this before. Everybody in China was addicted to it. As with WeChat, all your conveniences were sorted. Your love life, social life, work life, taxi drivers, shopping, your bank, everything ran through this one centralized app, which sounds amazing. Why don't we have this in the West? Well, that is until you realize this was artificially created with a special hand from the CCP to control every aspect of the Chinese population's lives, where all messages are censored, all your online actions are monitored by the CCP, deleted content included. Xi Jinping saw how effective Tencent had become at controlling the Chinese, and now it was time to control the entire world in the same way. But how could they do this? Now they'd be going up against the Silicon Valley empire, and things wouldn't be so simple. From 2012, Tencent used WeChat to take over China's digital world. And because of this, Tencent had made untold billions from this effective monopoly. And of course, so too did the CCP. But there's something interesting that happened with this. The Chinese government wasn't always so tied to companies. Before 2012, the CCP was mostly hands-off in its treatment of private companies. They had a small presence, but they weren't making big decisions or interfering that much. Since Xi's election in 2012 though, and the CCP has greatly increased its influence and pressure on Chinese-owned businesses, in a process they've called party building. Special laws were made requiring some Chinese companies to create communist party organizations within the corporate structure. Party members are placed on every running of the corporate ladder, making their mark on how the company operates. The leaders of these intercompany organizations are required to have a seat on the executive board and have the power to veto or alter company decisions. Tech companies and other businesses China deems useful for accruing soft power were specifically targeted above the rest. Companies like Huawei, with their focus on hardware and communications, or Tencent 
content with their potential for mass surveillance were at the top of the list. It's a kind of marriage between capitalism and communism that's utterly terrifying. In one way, it's a great deal for the companies. They get a free hand to ignore monopoly rules, exploit their customers, and dominate the competition. All with the implicit backing of the government, WeChat gave up their independence and were given over a billion customers. All they had to do was whatever the CCP wanted. This included building the most sophisticated program of mass surveillance history has ever seen, among other dark deeds. But the CCP's intention wasn't just to control their own population. They wanted to replicate and export this control. This way, they could then reach into the phones of other country citizens, taking their data and manipulating them with algorithms in whatever way they please. WeChat wasn't suited for this on its own. While the super app idea did catch on like wildfire in China, it wasn't as appealing in other countries. We already have our own apps, our own operating systems, and our own services from a wide range of Western tech companies. There's no way foreign users could be convinced to drop all of that for some Chinese app they'd barely even heard of. That wasn't the end of Tencent's role in China's rise to power though. Their control of China's digital world gave the government unparalleled control over their people. They could root out dissension and talk of freedom or government abuses on a truly national scale. Every person became their own informant, filling China's data servers with proof of their own disloyalty if they ever expressed it. Even while Tencent were busy taking over the country, they were also setting up the censorship machine and banning accounts that could rock the boat. In 2014, the CCP announced a month-long purge of all the legal and harmful information online, particularly targeting WeChat and other instant messaging apps. Major accounts which kept track of politics and news got banned, without any warning or the opportunity to appeal, as of course Xi Jinping couldn't allow any message other than the party line. What was much more invasive on individual people's freedoms though was a policy of scanning private messages between people. A year earlier, a Tibetan monk had been arrested for being in a group chat that organised the celebration of the Dalai Lama's birthday. But by 2016, WeChat had started openly censoring private messages between people. If the app detected anti-communist rhetoric or certain keywords in your message, then it simply couldn't send it. Any device registered to a Chinese number was subject to censorship, even outside of the country. Even VPNs didn't work against this new method of conversation control. But whilst there were and still are some cracks in the system, Tencent has near complete control of China's social media. And because of how integrated these tech companies are with the CCP, it means the governments are the ones really pulling the strings. But how could the CCP use Tencent to expand this control abroad? It was pretty simple in the end. The massive amounts of revenue meant that China had access to what's always been the West's most fatal weakness, as well as its greatest strength, money. Some of the CCP's investments into the West have been solely intended for spying and for revealing military information. Part of this campaign has been buying the land around air force bases and military installations by Chinese companies and investors. One case involved the purchase of 370 acres of land by the Chinese company Fu Feng Group, who have close ties to the CCP. Around 12 miles from a nearby air force base, the land would give its owners a great opportunity to get intel on America's air defense. A similar event saw a Chinese billionaire owned by the CCP buying 140 thousand acres of land in Texas. And where did this happen to be? Well, right next to the Laughlin Air Force Base. These are two of the attempts we know about. The opaque and secret nature of land purchases across the US means there could be tons more that we absolutely have no idea about. What's happening with Chinese buying, uh, the Chinese government or Chinese nationals buying uh, farmland, and it's around US military installations. It, it's, it's really, uh, concerning and and then when you look at what's happening at those military installations that they have land around like B2 stealth bomber training uh, drone training and all it's uh, very, very troubling. Often these CCP purchases of land will be conveniently close to missile silos. Some trying to push back against this information will point to how small a proportion Chinese investors buy compared to other countries. As Canadians buy tons more land in the US than China, so why should we be worried? Well, that's not what's alarming people. If the USSR had tried this during the Cold War, it never would have worked. People would have seen the obvious danger of buying land right next to military bases. As apart from spying, which is already a major danger here, there's also potential that these sites can be used to assess weaknesses in America's agricultural industry. If the CCP can figure out certain properties of the soil and sequence the genetic code of common crops, they could engineer a disease that could decimate the entire industry and put the whole nation into a food crisis. A lot of this is just speculation though. It's the actions of a wide range of different companies all with their own agendas. But to really identify how deep the CCP's control is, you only need to look at Tencent and how they've used their influence in the West.
In just the span of a couple of years, Tencent made huge investments in all manner of companies, targeting the most influential companies that control the public opinion, dumping huge amounts into Reddit, Discord, Spotify, Snapchat, every social media site they could control. And by having huge shares, this then by law means they have to send all data back to the CCP, posing a huge risk on privacy on all of these social media sites. But that's not all. Tencent would also begin pouring money into Tesla, Universal Music, among hundreds of other globally recognized brands that control the public consciousness, things that people live with on a day-to-day -day basis. And remarkably, Tencent also emerged as the world's leading gaming entity, outpacing all other competitors in revenue. From Pokemon Unite, to League of Legends and Fortnite. All right, listen up. These are some of the most popular video games in the world. And behind them is a Chinese company you may not be familiar with. Tencent is China's largest social media company. It is also the world's largest video game company by revenue. Which is an insane thing to do considering they're not even a gaming company. There's just one division within this giant conglomerate. And yet their gaming division alone surpasses the entire market value of giants like Nintendo or Sony, which Magnates Media did a great video on. And this comes from the fact that they have complete ownership of Riot Games, the developer behind League of Legends, and a 40% stake in Epic Games, known for making Fortnite, with other huge investments in all of the competition, Ubisoft, Activision Blizzard, and numerous other top gaming franchises, and even smaller ones like Miniclip, all those little so iPad games you play, all connected back to the CCP. This pattern of dominance extends beyond gaming. For instance, Tencent's payment services rival the scale of PayPal. And this video could just go on and on if I talked about Tencent, as they literally even control Hollywood film production today, as you could see with their involvement in movies like Men in Black, where they can literally control the narratives within these stories and hiding any mention of Taiwan as a country, all to support the CCP's aims of changing the culture globally. The sequel Top Gun Maverick features Cruz's character wearing a bomber jacket with the Taiwanese flag. That's a big no-no for Chinese censors. In Hollywood, they refer to it as the three T's, the things you cannot talk about. Taiwan, Tibet, and Tiananmen Square. And any movie that touches any of those third rail topics is likely not going to be shown in Chinese theaters. Slowly convincing the world to support China subconsciously without them even realizing it. The extent of Tencent's reach is so vast and complex. There's just so much to talk about here. And unfortunately, this video would just go on too long. But it's only recently that the West has even realized the influence Tencent has internationally and how it can control the flow of information. More to messages sent all around the world and influenced the minds of billions. Infamously, the CCP used Tencent to ban a pro-democracy supporter in Hong Kong from a Blizzard gaming tournament, with the CCP having its tentacles so deep into American culture that now just supporting Hong Kong can get you banned from gaming events. We can also see this with the NBA, who's also funded by Tencent. And due to Daryl Murray's tweet in support of Hong Kong, Tencent threatened to pull out all their money from the NBA, forcing all the players to come together to support China and take back any of their support for the pro-democracy movement within Hong Kong. Yeah, we apologize. Um, you know, you know, we love China. We love you know playing there. Uh, I know for, for both of us individually, we go there you know once or twice a year. Uh, they show us the most important love. So you know, we appreciate them as a fan base, and uh, we love everything you know they're about, and, and, uh, and you know we appreciate the support that they give us individually and as an organization. So. But why does this matter? All of Tencent and therefore the CCP's ownership of Western companies and Western institutions gives them unprecedented leverage. They can use it to silence dissenters and punish people who speak out against them whenever and wherever they see fit. It doesn't matter if you're an employee or a CEO, an esports commentator or an NBA manager, China's reach extends to you as well. But this kind of control generates headlines, exposure and controversy. The general atmosphere of silence and fear of speaking out helps, but when people break it like they have in the past, it can get messy. What would be far better and more effective is to subtly push and influence people from afar without them even knowing you're doing it. The carrot is more effective than the stick. In other words, banning certain words on WeChat might be necessary, but it's far better for the CCP if they don't need to. WeChat's most effective tools of censorship are algorithmic. People never see the alternative and the protest because they aren't visible. Meanwhile, people can broadcast whatever opinions they like as long as their message doesn't reach anyone else. To do this, the CCP would need a different app from WeChat. For reasons we've already discussed, it wasn't going to succeed in the 
Western market, or really anywhere that China doesn't already have great influence. They needed a new platform, which they could manipulate and twist to whatever purpose they liked, something which younger generations would buy into and get all of their information from. If the CCP was in control of such an app, it would give them a backdoor into billions of phones and devices around the world. They'd be able to subtly alter the opinions and worldviews of its users. They could even spread their own propaganda and messages, undermining the social fabric of foreign nations, all while strengthening their own people. And the answer came in 2016 in the form of a fast-growing social media app called Douyin in China, created by another CCP-owned tech company called ByteDance. Improving on what made Vine so popular in the mid-2010s, Douyin gave users a platform to create, edit, and share short-form videos. It was a formula that had worked in another Chinese app called Musical.ly, which had crossed the Pacific and found an audience in the US, especially when all these Vine stars like Jay Poo and Logan Poo were taking off. Musical.ly had an incredibly simplistic and intuitive user interface design, combined with an advanced algorithm that drew people in and rarely lost their attention. But back at home, and Douyin was growing rapidly, and this time it would be better, more controlled, and more addictive than anything anyone had ever seen before. And so in just a year after creating it, ByteDance had grown Douyin's user base from nothing to 100 million users. But how did they do it? Douyin's growth in China had been pushed to new heights by a specific marketing scheme focused on young girls and women. These users were encouraged to post videos lip-syncing and dancing along to popular songs. It was the creation of a whole new genre of addictive online videos. They were full of energy, drawing people in with attractive people dancing to pop music, all enhanced with flashy editing. It was perfect for targeting a very young audience. But what began as fun, innocent videos soon turned into a competition over looks and status. The best looking and most skilled dancers were the ones who got picked up by the algorithm, turning these random people into stars overnight. Word spread and millions were trying their hand at instant success and fame online. You could just upload a few videos and in a matter of months, be a megastar. Soon all these names popped up. It wasn't long before this CCP realized the potential of this and how it could take over the international market and be a true competitor to Silicon Valley owned social media companies. While the CCP wasn't too keen on its effects on young people in China, they did see how effective it was in controlling them. Even in a far more restricted culture than the West, the app was incredibly fast spreading. If the Chinese people were this enthralled with the app, then what would be the effect on a far less socially conservative audience by Westerners? Well, by the end of 2017, the CCP was eager to find out. A clone of Douyin was created and changed for the foreign market. Its name was TikTok. You all know by now what TikTok is. Over 900 million people across the world use the app every single day. In a way, TikTok has taken on some of the same characteristics that made WeChat so popular. As it's grown, ByteDance has released more and more features to round out that experience. Now you can shop through it, connect with your friends, and create a whole digital life and persona through it. What a surprise. Every day, it becomes more embedded in a culture and more irreplaceable to its users. It means that ByteDance has become a massive company that will soon be able to rival the Western tech giants like Google and Meta. Of course, that's not China's true intentions with the app. It doesn't hurt if it makes them billions of dollars of course, but Xi Jinping had something else in mind when he put the whole weight of the CCP behind it. He saw TikTok as a weapon, the crown jewel in his plans for cognitive warfare. So let's explore what he has in mind for TikTok, and how it can be weaponized on a societal level and just how dangerous this app truly is. But first, what's cognitive warfare? As different technologies have improved over history, new battlefields and theaters of war have emerged with them. It wasn't long after the invention of sailing that warfare took to the seas. At the turn of the 20th century, the invention of aircraft brought war to the skies. And the most recent of these technological leaps has been the rise of the internet. Obviously, you can't hurt people directly with it. Nobody's ever died because they got a computer virus. But what you can can do is influence society's cultures, people's minds on a huge scale. Over history, battles and entire wars have been done this way, by destroying the enemy's morale. This is the key point of the art of war, Xi Jinping's handbook. If one side thought they were going to lose, then they usually would. Before, wearing parties would try and influence each other through fear or posters or word of mouth. And comparing these methods to the internet is like comparing a hand grenade to an atomic bomb. It enables your message to spread across entire societies within hours, all at the push of a button. But what's dangerous about Cognitive warfare is that it's about more than just sending a message. Cognitive warfare means you can peer into people's minds, learn their secrets and their weaknesses, then subtly push them towards disunity and chaos. It's not just changing people's minds, but controlling their brains. How powerful is this really? It wasn't China that first proved the effectiveness of basic cognitive warfare. Instead, it was actually the West. Through providing the infrastructure and the means of communication online, the West created a wave of revolution in the Middle East, the Arab Spring riots. Tensions had already been building for years, but it was the internet and a swing in public Public opinion that sparked Gaddafi's deposition, for example, or just take the start of the war in Syria. I know this is the first Arab revolution of the 21st century, or it will be brutally suppressed. Tense new beginnings for Tunisia, its Arab neighbors nervous of how revolutionary feelings could spread. 
Mubarak deposed. Egypt's 18-day revolution defies all expectation. Rarely can a military takeover have been greeted with such enthusiasm as it is on the streets of Cairo tonight. This was all unfolding as she was taking power in China, and he saw the internet and this primitive form of cognitive warfare play havoc on what's effectively an entire continent. Without a single soldier, the US and the West brought down regimes that had stood for decades. Divisions in these societies were exploited, gaps were widened, and people's ambitions for a brighter future only held to chaos and anarchy. But all of this was still child's play compared to what he had planned. He knew Western society was divided and split along ideological boundaries. If the CCP are masters of any craft, it's controlling the hearts and minds of their own people. Or if they could use these powers as a weapon as well. Well, this all came into the poisoning of America. By plunging the US and other Western nations into chaos, he can make them weaker. And if they were weaker, he could then push his imperialist aims for China further. His nation would be able to emerge from their century of shame and climb to the very top of the world stage, as long as the US didn't interfere. His aim was always fixed on an eventual war in the future. He instituted a campaign of reform for the military and extra spending on the military. On his election day, Chinese defense spending was at around $145 billion for the the year. Five years later, and it's risen to $210 billion. But this number only counts the money spent on things like bombs, tanks, bullets, and missiles. China's true weapon of the future was poisoning the US through soft power. And at the front of this was TikTok. And the app would play a huge role in this new form of conflict. We're so interconnected with the world through our mobile phones today that studies now claim they're more likely an extension of our own minds than just a tool. Even Elon Musk says this. Uh, that's the, that your phone is already an extension of you. You're already a cyborg. You don't even, well, most people don't realize they are already a cyborg. In lots of ways, going through someone's phone data can tell you a lot more about them than they do. You get a mathematical picture of what they think about, what questions they ask, and how they spend their time. You can see the company they keep, what they're doing with their life, and where they fit into society. This only works because we've offloaded so many different cognitive processes onto our smartphones. We do it all the time for basic information and small things. There's no point working out complex sums yourself when you've got a calculator in your pocket. Snapchat can tell you someone else his birthday instead of you having to remember it. But even for much bigger issues, the internet can always tell you how to feel or what to think. You'll fall into certain online groups based on who you are, and they'll give you an oven-ready ideology and worldview. Millions of years of social evolution have made us naturally try to fit in and believe whatever we regularly hear and experience. If we're building our ideas and experiencing the world through our smartphones, then functionally, they're part of us now. In a lot of ways, it's a positive revolution in the human experience. Never before have we had access to so much knowledge so freely, but so many people putting parts of their brain into the digital world has its drawbacks. If your smartphone is unconsciously doing all of this thinking and reasoning for you, then it means your brain is vulnerable. All of these thoughts are being decided by forces outside of your control. The information that does come in is chosen by algorithms. Usually these algorithms are designed to trigger your emotions and keep you fixated for as long as possible. That's what makes tech companies the most money. But in TikTok's case, there's another layer of destructive intentions on top of that. It's worth remembering as we go through these hidden motives that TikTok is the number one platform used by the next generation. Two thirds of teenagers use it, and probably far more than this. And even that proportion is still growing. They're also the generation that offloads the largest part of their brain online. It makes it the most influential social media site on what the future will look like. And some of what makes TikTok so destructive as a weapon is a byproduct of how it's structured to increase retention. After billions of dollars and decades spent on research, social media companies have found that information is the most addictive when it's delivered in short bursts. Short videos with simple messages and themes that don't outstay their welcome are what's best for this. It means that people using TikTok are bombarded with tons of different ideas and messages, all mashed up into one chaotic scroll session. If your algorithm repeats certain messages over and over again, they'll begin to unconsciously sink in and worm their way into people's worldviews. This is helped along by the way all of these different messages and pieces of information overload your brain. TikTok's particular tendency to do this is completely intentional. While scrolling, people might see five different posts all advertising different problems of democracies and Western nations. They'll be about homelessness or drug use or corruption or any other controversial or embarrassing topic. This is the first phase of this kind of warfare. The more divided and just awful TikTok can make the West seem, the better. People will subconsciously carry all of these negative views of the world inside of them, and it will change how they actually experience life. An apathetic, divided, and confused population is much weaker overall. And within China, it's completely different. Unlike the US, where you see shaking asses, brain-dead takes, and just the most mind-numbing content imaginable, in China, you see people being praised for their high math scores, people building 
great feats of engineering and people saluting the Chinese government, completely taking the Chinese generation and the US generation in two very different directions. And as the West direction gets weaker, it means China can dominate their own parts of the world more easily. They can get away with more human rights abuses and sweep more of their crimes under the rug because they control the flow of information that you're witnessing all of this stuff on. How would you know anything if they can censor anything? This is why TikTok works great as propaganda. It makes their authoritarian society seem much more attractive. On TikTok, you'll always see these random videos of Chongqing or Beijing or Shanghai showing how beautiful, how clean, and how attractive these places truly are. But you never see this about the West. Same thing with the Hong Kong protests in China, all completely banned. Tiananmen Square, completely banned. The Uyghur genocide, completely banned. And because of these information blackouts, we don't hear what's really happening in China. We only hear the state's narrative. And inevitably, that ends up being the most biased view of all. Democracy and freedom ends up looking like a different name for anarchy, whilst dictatorship becomes the only viable way towards living in a peaceful society. And if China can then use this to install friendly dictatorships, they can then exert their influence on the world far more easily across the world. It's already happening. It isn't just because of TikTok, of course, but from 2021 to 2023, nine more countries fell into the grips of authoritarian regimes, particularly with a high use of TikTok within Africa specifically and Central Asia, the new battlegrounds where China is expanding its sphere of influence. It's looking like there are going to be a lot more dictatorships in our near future. But what's the reason behind all of these new regimes? Well, you could easily make a case that this is because of China's aggressive diplomacy and efforts to build their own bloc of allies. It doesn't matter what you do to your people, China is always eager to get involved. They could give you a massive loan to spend on a vanity project or some much needed infrastructure. And of course, it all comes at a price. Often these loans become more exploitative than helpful, trapping countries in cycles of debts. This is happening all around the world right now. Any dictator who lets Huawei build his communications infrastructure shouldn't be surprised when he's not the only one spying on his people. You can see why Xi Jinping is happy to let his companies break international embargoes and do business with evil genocidal rulers. But what's shocking is that this still happens in the West. Most of the UK's infrastructure is being built by China. In fact, Huawei was building the 5G networks in China up until just a few years ago. Even the H2 Railway. All of these huge upcoming projects in the UK were being built by the CCP. But this isn't the only reason we've seen so many people lose their freedom over the past few years. While it probably wasn't their intention, and it's unlikely they planned any of this, COVID certainly has given governments around the world emergency powers and privileges. Inevitably, even after the threat was long gone, they held onto them and abused them. And China can both almost certainly be blamed for the pandemic, as well as in leading the authoritarian reaction to it. In the US alone, it is estimated that well over 1 million people have died from the virus, a virus that was almost seemingly orchestrated by China. To be specific, it almost definitely escaped from a lab in Wuhan, a city of 11 million people located in central China. However, when the head of the WHO suggested this, the CCP was quick to lash out, rubbishing the idea that China was to blame for the deaths of tens of millions of people around the world. And although the World Health Organization is hugely funded by China, with the Ethiopian socialist running it, who's been accused multiple times of being way too sympathetic to China, even had to state the possibility that perhaps the origin story wasn't completely correct. Acknowledging the theory, suggesting the virus might have escaped from a virology laboratory located in close proximity to Hunan Market, where similar viruses are being studied, but China, unhelpful in the extreme, refused to comply with the WHO request for further cooperation, which only fueled more suspicions that a lab leak was very likely. But instead of being transparent, China instead chose to blame the US Army for starting the pandemic, a classic art of war strategy. However, a report in the Sunday Times published in June of 2023 said that Chinese scientists were running a covert project of dangerous experiments that caused a leak from the Wuhan Institute of Virology that started the COVID outbreak. Citing US investigators, the report said there was no published information on the work as it was done in collaboration with researchers from the Chinese military, who funded it and were actively pursuing bioweapons. For years, this institute has done crazy experiments on coronaviruses obtained from bat caves in southern China. At first, the results of these experiments were disclosed to the public, and the institute defended their actions by stating that the potential risks were warranted as the research could contribute to the development of vaccines. In truth, though, it played a huge part in creating a deadly virus that ruined hopes, dreams, and countless lives, robbing people of their jobs, their homes, their freedom, their loved ones, and also their life, years under lockdown. How many kids had their development stunted? How many people gained mental illnesses because of this? This didn't just suddenly come out of nowhere. In 2016, a significant discovery was made by researchers in Mojang, Wunan province, where they identified a novel coronavirus in a mine shaft, which was linked to the deaths of individuals with symptoms resembling SARS. But instead of alerting the international community about these fatalities, China kept it a secret. According to the report, the virus discovered in that location is now acknowledged as the sole predecessor of COVID. In other words, according to the Times report, 
China is to blame for COVID. What a shock. But Xi and his communist colleagues would have the world believe otherwise. It can't be doubted though that the country at the top of Xi's list for installing an autocratic regime is one closest to home. Now throughout all of Chinese history, Taiwan has been part of the CCP's ideology to come under their control, with the CCP never seeing Taiwan as a separate country. This was due to the nationalist forces breaking away and solidifying the territory of Taiwan during the Chinese Revolution, making Taiwan a completely separate country, breaking away from the CCP. But to Mao Zedong and Xi Jinping alike, this has been an embarrassment, a shameful piece of history for China, and so they don't even admit that Taiwan is a country. All flags of Taiwan are banned, even in the US, where companies like Tencent force people to remove the Taiwanese flag or any mention of the country even outside of China. And whilst the CCP has always wanted to conquer Taiwan, it's only been up until recently that it seems like China might actually be close to doing so. Xi has been hinting at an invasion ever since he became president, because this all fits into the one China policy of Xi Jinping, making China the world's superpower, uniting all of the Chinese people. And yet this is impossible if Taiwan remains an independent country. Even today, Taiwan is officially known as the Republic of China, with both countries claiming to be the true China on the diplomatic stage. So if Xi Jinping was able to take over Taiwan once and for all, this would cement his name in Chinese history forever. At least that's how he sees it. Outside of symbolic reasons though, China does have one extremely important reason to take over the country, and that's due to their semiconductor industry. Taiwan makes up over half of the entire world's high quality semiconductors. But what is semiconductors? Taiwan's incredibly complex, intricate machines are the only ones in the world capable of making the high quality chips that go into everything from phones to ballistic missiles. Taking control of this would give Xi the technological monopoly that he craves. It would also give him real leverage over the rest of the world, and it would take away one of America's best tools for limiting China's power on the world stage. These are the reasons why he's focused nearly all of China's military development on an eventual invasion. His focus on missiles and the navy are designed to prepare for an amphibious landing. So much so that in the last 10 years, Xi Jinping's made China's navy the biggest in the world, even overtaking the US's. But it's not just that. China's air force today is constantly violating Taiwanese airspace, with the People's Liberation Army running practice drills for the inevitable invasion. On just one day alone in 2023, 103 Chinese fighter planes ignored Taiwanese airspace and flew around the island's coast, with the Chinese practicing landing on Taiwan and storming the presidential building with a replica model of the actual presidential building in Taiwan. It's plausible that for the last few years, Xi Jinping has been hoping to bully Taiwan into submission. But of course, this isn't going to be enough. Everybody in NATO and the US is very aware that Taiwan can't be lost to China. Ukraine was already bad enough, but Taiwan might even be worse. Because if China takes over Taiwan, China can then line up nukes all the way to Australia. It has huge control of the Red China Sea, giving China way more power in the Asian Pacific. And Taiwan will be unlikely to go without a fight. They don't want to become a Hong Kong. They don't want to lose their democracy. And so Taiwan has been building up their defenses for years, as they know the true threat that communism poses. But it is unlikely that a country with under 24 million people could fend off one with well over a billion. But as Biden and many other top US politicians are claiming, the US will interfere if China invades Taiwan. This is the biggest issue for China, that the West is stopping China taking over Taiwan. But if China could shift public opinion and weaken the US's resolve to fight, then they could invade without anyone doing anything about it. TikTok and the other tools of soft power give them the chance to do this. Once they're certain the US won't intervene, they'll get their plans for invasion ready. It's just another reason why TikTok, Tencent, and all of China's spying is such a huge issue. This crisis comes at a time when Chinese espionage in the US is at an all-time high, with the CCP finding new and inventive ways of stealing secrets and harvesting ungodly amounts of data. It's already reported that China has stolen 80% of American adults' personal data. Which brings us to Temu, just one of the latest Trojan horses from Beijing. Owned and operated by PDD Holdings, the Temu platform made its debut in the United States in September of 2022. It swiftly gained popularity, emerging as the most frequently downloaded application in the country. It isn't hard to see why. Temu takes some of the most addictive parts of TikTok's social media and mobile games and wraps them up into one awful package. And as with any addiction, it's not actually about the thing itself. It doesn't matter if the products are cheap garbage, that's not what Temu is selling. Their shop like a billionaire advert hint at what the real deal is. You see, going through Temu's shady cash 
catalog and ordering 20 different $3 items offers a kind of freedom that's hard to find anymore. Especially with the double punch of COVID and economic recession, Temu's target audience has to think about every single purchase they make. For the hundreds of millions of people without savings to fall back on, one or two extravagant purchases can make the difference between paying rent or getting evicted. The average American or European's relative poverty makes the experience of carefree shopping they're selling that much more enticing. Their hope is that people will go on these spending sprees and get hooked. The dopamine release through buying all of this stuff will make new connections in the reward centers in people's brains, and they'll find themselves drawn back to Temu. Every part of the app is meant to cater to this process of addiction. The small games and random prizes add even more dopamine and help to form patterns. Users can get more spins and play more games through sharing it with their friends, getting new people hooked to Temu in the process. It's a classic pyramid scheme tactic that Temu is happy to exploit. Shopping addiction and hoarding are two growing problems in the West, spurred on by Temu's predatory business model. And it's yet another example of a Chinese company preying on the West's psychological weakness. You might hope that this is the only reason Temu is so awful. Unfortunately though, it's only the tip of the iceberg. The app, which offers heavily discounted goods shipped directly from China, scares and continues to scare many prominent politicians. And for a good reason. Chinese apps steal your data. We've already shown this time and time again. But Temu might actually be worse. You see, it's sister app Pindudu, which discovered to have developed malicious software on unsuspecting customers' devices, which essentially plundered their phones and computers for sensitive information. Furthermore, they incorporated programming that made the app extremely difficult to remove. And although the app was initially removed from Google Play, it wasn't long before it was made available again. And in the age of cyber warfare, it's also important to note that Chinese spies regularly use spyware to initiate devastating attacks and steal data. Upon this shady programming being exposed, Pindudu allegedly removed the malware. However, there are reports suggesting that the software engineer team responsible for this incident was never actually terminated, but rather relocated. To where exactly? To Temu. Are you truly willing to install a Chinese app on your cell phone that would have access to your entire contact list, calendars and photo albums, as well as your social media accounts, chats and text messages? Well sadly, tens of millions of Americans are, and not just Americans. Temu is widely popular around the world, including in the UK. Some might argue that Temu is not unique, as all companies gather personal data. While it's true that all technology companies are obsessed with the idea of collecting personal data, Chinese apps are a different beast altogether. You see in China, private companies like PDD are obligated to hand over any data they collect to the state, resulting in the largest data collection efforts ever witnessed. And only recently, only after almost a decade of Xi Jinping being in power, has America woken up to all of this. As in April of 2023, a serious concerns were finally raised by the United States China Economic and Security Review Commission regarding the potential risks to users' personal data on Temu. One month later, and the governor of Montana in the United States issued a statewide ban on Temu and other made in China apps he deemed to be treacherous Trojan horses for the CCP. That's why only recently, up until now, in March of 2024, are we finally starting to see hope that TikTok might actually be banned, along with Temu and all these other garbage apps. And all of this stuff is funded by a state that is effectively using Uyghur forced labor to produce their goods, like all of China's cheap products. And does Temu plan to end the forced labor anytime soon? Well, of course not. This is the business model. It's run by the Chinese government. After all, the app has openly admitted that it, quote, does not expressly prohibit the sale of goods from the Uyghur region. And according to Temu, it doesn't perform audits or provide any compliance system to assess whether its suppliers adhere to US forced labor law. Temu simply requires its suppliers to agree to generic terms and conditions that prohibit forced labor. However, without any mechanism to ensure accountability for this prohibition, the chances of achieving compliance are really minimal. But Temu is just the latest weapon in a whole array of attacks on America right now. As we've seen, Xi Jinping is changing the face of China forever. In his over decade of power, the country has slipped back into pseudo-Maoism, amped up its efforts to destabilize the West and solidify its own grip on Asia and beyond by threatening the takeover of Taiwan. Of course, none of this is the fault of the Chinese people themselves. This has nothing to do with China, but its government. And Chinese people didn't choose their governments or where they were born. And it's a tragedy what's happening here, as they're the ones who are living under the iron grip of the CCP. And because of how these authoritarian societies control every aspect of life, most won't even know what a better alternative even looks like. They're too indoctrinated or fearful to be able to break out from the CCP's programming. We all imagine we'd stand up to tyrants before it's our own lives and families on the line. Which is why America needs to wake up to what's happening. The poisoning of America. The spread of the CCP across the world. Because if we keep continuing in this direction, the world is slowly going to lose more and more of our freedoms until there's absolutely nothing left apart from tyranny and control. Control. 